in uh, this one. Let's see, do you see my screen? Sorry, it's a little bit yes, messy. Sir. Yeah. I'm gonna hide this. Now view, slideshow. Okay, you see my screen? Yes, sir. we also see a big cursor. That's Very good, that's on purpose. Yeah, yeah. No, it's good. <laughs> it's on purpose. Okay, yes. I leave the floor to you. So <laughs> we have the fifth okay. lecture about CMB by Yassine. All right. So let me start by, I don't know why it doesn't let me move to the next one. That's gonna be annoying. Sorry, it doesn't let me move to the next one. Mm, I'm sorry. View full screen. You still see my, my uh, slides? Yes. Okay. I'm just gonna remove this uh, uh, little, okay. Let's see if it works. Okay, it works. Good, so let me uh, uh, start by asking this question. This is a question I asked last time. Which one of these equations is incorrect? Can someone, uh, does someone have an answer here? Okay, timing. <laughs> so two of these equations are incorrect. And this is uh, something that lots of even professors get wrong. So the stress energy tensor of baryons and the stress energy of tensor of photons are not separately conserved. The total stress energy tensor of baryons and photons is conserved. However, baryons and photons exchange momentum and energy. And that's a very, very key aspect of CMB anisotropies. If this wasn't there, the CMB would look very different. So CMB anisotropies are, uh, are really regulated by uh, Thomson scattering, which makes these two separately not conserved. It's one of my favorite trick questions. Everyone gets it wrong. Okay, so let's, ah, I don't know why it doesn't work. So I'm gonna talk today briefly about CMB polarization, uh, as this is a very important aspect of the CMB, but I'm not gonna go in as much detail as uh, we went for uh, the uh, intensity. So I'm not gonna derive the full hierarchy. So the basic picture is shown here. So suppose we have some electromagnetic wave, which is polarized, vertically this way, and suppose it scatters at a right angle here, then the outgoing intensity will be exactly the same, uh, will, will not be suppressed. Now suppose that we have a polarization which is in the plane of the scattering as shown here, then as a, uh, out, the outgoing wave will have zero electromagnetic uh, radiation. This wave uh, will be completely suppressed when it scatters in this direction, okay? So let's derive this a little bit more mathematically now. So electromagnetic waves in vacuum are transverse in the sense that if you have an electromagnetic wave E, so this is electric field uh, propagating in some direction N hat, which is the same as the, you know, the photon propagation direction. This is perpendicular to N hat. Electric field oscillates and magnetic fields, they oscillate perpendicular to directional propagation. So just to be clear what I mean here, this is a complex electric field amplitude such that the actual electric field as a function of time and position is this real part of this electric field amplitude times e to the i omega t minus n dot x. Okay, why isn't it, sorry, working my, I don't know why it doesn't let me switch slides easily. So now let's figure out how the outgoing, so I've, Call the outgoing wave without a prime and the incoming one with the prime. Okay, so I want to relate E to E prime. So if I have some linear uh, scattering event, E should be linearly related to E prime. For, for moreover, if I don't have uh, any dipole or things like this, it's not going to have any gradients. It's just going to be literally E proportional to E prime. Now, because E here is perpendicular to the directional propagation n hat, this must be proportional to E prime projected perpendicular to n hat. So this is simply the projection of E prime, the incoming wave, perpendicular to n, n hat, which is the direction of the outgoing wave. Okay, so remember that the intensity of electromagnetic waves, so the, either the, the momentum flux or uh, the energy density is proportional to E squared. There's like one over eight pi uh, factor here. 
So beyond the intensity, so here so far, we had been working with the total intensity, which is proportional to the photon occupation number, which is proportional to the photon field space density. So more generally, and actually, uh, I don't see the, sorry, I don't really see the chat or anything. So, so Paolo, if there's any questions in the chat, you'll have to tell me. Okay, okay I will. Okay. 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 Um, because I have this control panel, which is really annoying on the way, so I'm hiding it. Sorry, I hide floating panel. Good. So uh, we're going to generalize this expression to a tensor, IAB, which is EAEB, complex conjugate. And this total intensity is nothing but the trace of this uh, tensor, All right? So from this relationship between the outgoing electric field and the incoming electric field, which is again, the projection perpendicular to the outgoing region. If you take this uh, expression here, you can see, just work it out. Take this A component times this B component. You'll find that this outgoing intensity IAB, intensity tensor is going to be proportional to, so just work this out. IAB prime basically doubly projected perpendicular to the outgoing direction n. So this is just a geometric thing that tells me that the outgoing intensity is equal to the incoming intensity, which I project twice on both indices perpendicular to n, which is the outgoing direction. And I integrate over all possible directions of incoming wave n prime. And here is some proportionality constants to be uh, determined. So, so far I've really just done some pure geometric arguments. To determine lambda, what are we going to say? For Thomson scattering, Thomson scattering is only pure elastic scattering, does not absorb energy, does not radiate additional energy. So we're going to require that the total power that comes out, which is the integral over all directions of the total intensity, is equal to the total power that comes in, which same, same thing is integral over n prime of intensity of n prime. So I'm gonna first take the trace of the equation before this equation here. I'm gonna take the trace because this is related to, this is the total intensity. And then if you take the trace, I encourage you to work this out for yourselves. You're gonna find this expression. Then <coughs> if you integrate over all directions, this n a and b is gonna give us one third of delta a b. And so then you find that the integral over all direction of i n, which is the outgoing power, is two thirds of lambda times the incoming power. So we found that the from the simple conservation of total power, uh, we found that this coefficient lambda uh, must be three halves. Now all of this business is for each Thomson scattering event. So now instead of this equation here, I want to write a d i a b d t is the number of Thomson scattering events per unit time times this whole expression where this lambda is three halves. And if I do this. I get this expression. DDT of this intensity tensor is equal. So this is the rate of Thomson scattering and this is taking photons which are were originally in the direction N and then are scattered outside of the direction N. And this is now all the photons which were originally in some direction N prime scattered into the direction N. That's the term we just described now. So this now is an expression that generalizes the Thomson collision operator for not just the total intensity, but for some polarized intensity IAB. Now, what do we do with this? We can split this IAB into a total intensity part. Basically it's trace plus something which is trace free, which is the polarization. So this is how this expression looks like. So this I here, this whole thing must be per perpendicular to N hat. So this is the identity tensor projected perpendicular to n hat and I'm dividing it by two so that its trace is going to be unity. And the remainder is the polarization tensor. Note here that I'm not talking about circular polarization. I'm hiding some details under the rug, but here this is only the linear polarization tensor. It is symmetric, trace free, and it is perpendicular to n hat. So it means it has only two independent components. And uh, you can, choose a specific basis, call these components Q and U, but you can actually also work every, everything out without ever specifying a basis and just using purely geometric uh, expressions. 
Okay, so if I take this expression now, we better recover more or less what we had uh, when we talked about Thomson scattering for the total intensity of electromagnetic waves. So if I take the trace of this expression, you can, again, you're encouraged to work it out and you will find that you get, it, the first line is exactly what we had in terms of Thomson scattering. You recognize this three over 16 pi, one plus n dot n prime squared. This is the, uh, angular dependence of the Thomson scattering operator. And this came really just from finding these factors of three half. Okay, so it's really purely geometric reasoning. But you also find that the polarization uh, tensor here comes in uh, into this other piece. So the first thing I want you to uh, remember is that the polarization uh, of the electromagnetic waves actually also sources the total intensity. So the Boltzmann equations that I wrote down were missing uh, pieces, which are the fact that polarization actually feeds into the Boltzmann equations for the total intensity. Now, you if see, we look at the trace free part of that equation here, yes? Sorry, there is a question. Yes. Um, so whether NA is defined in the electron rest frame. Yes, this is, uh, that's right. So this whole experiment Expression, just like we did in class for the for the total intensity. That's right. So then you have to properly transform uh, back to the uh, co-moving frame. Okay. So so now if we go back to this, we, we just took the trace for the total intensity, and then if we look at the trace free part, you would get an equation for the polarization tensor. It's going to have some term which is minus rate of Thomson scattering times polarization tensor plus some integral of scattering of polarization of directions n, n prime into n. But there's also a term which is proportional to, and I'm not going to write it in detail, it's just going to have some, some messy term, but it's basically proportional to some projection of the quadrupole moment of the total intensity. So, a very important thing to remember, if you remember only one thing, is that the polarization, linear polarization is sourced by the quadrupole moment, which is proportional to the photon anisotropic stress of the total intensity, i.e. The, by the quadrupole moment of the temperature uh, anisotropies, okay? So to see this a little bit more pictorially, this is, if you look at any tutorials, this is the kind of stuff you're gonna see, but if you wanna look at the mathematical thing, again, I encourage you to go back to these equations and check for yourselves that this comes uh, math mathematically. So pictorially, a quadrupole moment in intensity looks like this. So let's see that I'm looking at uh, waves coming out of the board in uh, my direction. And this is a quadrupole moment uh, in the plane perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So it's a quadrupole moment of total intensity. So I have some, some hot spots here and some cold spots here. Hot spots mean larger temperature, larger intensity, it means that the amplitude of the electromagnetic field is larger. And if I start with a total intensity, meaning an unpolarized wave, I have the same amplitude in both directions here. And here, if it's a cold spot, I also have the same amplitude in both directions, but the overall amplitude here is smaller than there because it's a cold spot. Okay, so now uh, it's, it's difficult to see the geometry, but again, this, these hot spots and cold spots are in the plane of the slide and I'm looking perpendicular to the plane. So the geometry tells me that this polarization, as it scatters towards me outside of the plane, it's, you know, it's unimpeded, it scatters without being affected, but the vertical polarization is completely suppressed by Thomson scattering. Same thing for the bottom hotspot. So from these hotspots, I only get this horizontal red arrow. I get a purely uh, horizontal linear polarization arising from these hotspots. Now from these cold spots, I get the same, uh, the same reasoning gives me that I get only this vertical arrow. Now, if both had exactly the same length of arrows, I would get you know, a, a cross here of arrows with the same amplitude, meaning an unpolarized uh, radiation. But because I have an arrow which is longer, it means that the electromagnetic wave, which is outgoing, is more polarized along the horizontal direction. Okay, so this is the pictorial explanation of why a quadrupole in intensity is generating a uh, linear polarization after Thomson scattering. Okay, so uh, this is really a speed of flight introduction. There, in practice, there are 
uh, Boltzmann equations and a Boltzmann hierarchy that is written for also for the, the polarization and it's coupled with the intensity. But this is kind of the gist, the essential piece of physics that uh, you should know if you know nothing else about it. I wanna also briefly talk about the E and B modes. So beware that E here no longer means electric field. Okay, it's a different thing. I'm gonna define what it means now. So if you have a three-dimensional vector field, hopefully you're familiar with this Helmholtz decomposition of a vector field. Any three-dimensional vector field, I can write it as the gradient of the scalar field plus the curl of a divergence-free vector field, A. If I go to Fourier space, this is saying that V is IK times phi plus IK cross A. So this is longitudinal, i.e. it is parallel to K. And this is transverse, i.e. it is perpendicular to K. And this has two independent components because A itself is perpendicular to K. So this is basically a geom in Fourier space, a geometric decomposition of any vector field. Okay, so now we're gonna do something very similar for the polarization tensor. So let's consider first a small region of the scale. So this has to be all done in terms of spherical harmonics and tensor spherical harmonics, but we're gonna get an intuitive understanding by considering a small region of the sky so that it's an approximately flat region. And so I can do two dimensional Fourier transforms in this flat region. Okay, so for the temperature field, instead of using theta LMs, I can use theta of vector L where vector L is a two dimensional uh, vector um, perpendicular to the line of sight. And same thing for the polarization tensor. I can also Fourier transform it as a function of this two dimensional uh, harmonic vector L. Okay, so this is the drawing here. Suppose we have a small region of the sky uh, whose direction, so perpendicular to the direction N hat, which is the direction uh, from which photons come. And we can do Fourier transforms uh, on the small region of the sky. Now this Fourier two-dimensional wave number is related. So if you think of photons coming mostly from the last scattering surface, this should be an eta zero, by the way. So this is basically, so this is dimensionless. So this is basically eta zero minus eta star times the three-dimensional Fourier wave number, but it's okay. But this has to be projected perpendicular to N, okay? Because this is this lives in this flat sky perpendicular to the direction of propagation of photons. So this K minus K dot N, N is just the component of K perpendicular to N. Recall uh, that the total intensity tensor, because it is basically E electric field A times electric field B, and that the electric field is perpendicular to the direction of propagation for transverse waves, this tensor is perpendicular to the direction N, and so is the case for the uh, polarization tensor. All right, so now we have this polarization tensor. First of all, we're gonna reduce it to a two-dimensional vector. I'm gonna define this VB by taking this uh, Fourier, two-dimensional Fourier wave number L, dotting, dotting it into PAB. So basically, what I'm doing here, if I had the full uh, you know, vector L uh, times an I, I would be taking the divergence. So this vector V is basically this divergence of this polarization tensor, okay? Now this vector V is perpendicular to the direction N, just like P is perpendicular to N. So this vector V is a 2D vector that lives in this flat sky. It's perpendicular to N. Okay, so now, just like we did Helmholtz decomposition in three dimensions, we're gonna do Helmholtz decomposition of this two dimensional vector. It has one part which is longitudinal, which is a long L hat. And this is what we call the E mode. And again, this is nothing to do with the electric field anymore. Unfortunately, this is the same letter. So this is the E mode of the polarization, plus a part which is transverse to uh, L. So it's L cross something but it has to also be transverse to N because remember this vector lives perpendicular to the direction N hat. So the actual component here is N hat cross L. And this piece here is the B mode. So here we have a two dimensional vector because it's, it lives in this flat sky and the plane. And so we're saying that there is a part for every Fourier wave number L, there's a part which is longitudinal with L and a part which is transverse to L but still lives in the plane. So in terms of how do we relate this E and B to the initial uh, polarization tensor. 
So you can see that E is basically L dot V. And remember that V was proportional to basically it's like the inverse Laplacian of this, proportional to the divergence of P. So here, if we dot this again, and this P, sorry, this should have a double arrow. This is a rank two tensor. So this E mode is basically the divergence of the polarization tensor, the double divergence of the polarization tensor. And the B mode is basically the curl of the divergence of the polarization tensor dotted perpendicular, uh, dotted into the, the line of sight. And, okay, so now here's this E mode and B mode, uh, very important theorem. Uh, so if we start with purely scalar initial conditions, uh, and if these initial conditions are, uh, it doesn't matter if they're adiabatic or whatever, or what matters is that they're scalar. So scalar means that they're defined by, they're defined by a scalar quantity, and this generalizes to multiple scalar quantities. So this vector V, which is the divergence of the polarization tensor for a given L, I can relate it linearly to the initial condition, zeta, the curvature perturbation, say if it's adiabatic. So I need to integrate over all the longitudinal uh, wave number K parallel. So K parallel to the line of sight. And remember that this L is basically proportional to the K perpendicular to the line of sight. I have some transfer function. Before, in the previous lecture, I had written it in terms of a, a function which depends on k magnitude and k dotted into n. Equivalently, you can think of it as a k perpendicular and k parallel is the same thing. Now, this whole thing is a vector. And here I start with a scalar. I need to make a vector out of this scalar. Okay, I have two preferred directions. I have my vector l and I have my vector n hat. However, this V is perpendicular to n hat. So the only vector I have left is this vector L. Okay, this is basically the only preferred direction. If I specify n hat, the sort of flat sky region in which direction is perpendicular to it. If I look at one specific Fourier mode vector L, then I have these two preferred directions out of which I can build my vector V. And because it's perpendicular to n, I am left with only L. So basically this, is a simple reasoning and it's going a little bit fast. So I encourage you to think through it in more depth, but this is the gist of why, right? uh, this very simple geometric reasoning, why scalar initial conditions imply a purely longitudinal uh, polarization tensor, meaning they imply no B modes. And again, the B mode is the curl of the divergence of the polarization tensor. So the theorem is that if you have purely scalar initial conditions, you get no B modes. So you can look for B modes if you want to search for tensor modes. So to see this a little bit more in detail, now suppose instead I have tensor initial conditions. So usually tensors, so the gravitational waves is small h i j, but because my h's and my k's look very much the same, for to avoid any confusion, I'm calling it big H i j. Okay, so this is the metric, the tra transverse trace tree perturbation to the metric. It is transverse, meaning it is perpendicular to the Fourier mode K. So we can do something similar. We can relate this vector V to some integral with some transfer function. And I want to relate it to this object which has two indices. So now I have one index and I want to relate it to something that has two indices. And what do I have available? I have n hat, I have, uh, and, I, and I guess this might not be uh, quite correct now. I have to think, but well, everyone should think about it a little bit more. But the point is that when I have these two indices, you can actually make something which has not only a, a longitudinal component E, but also a non-zero uh, B mode component. And again, uh, think about this in a little bit more detail because now I'm having some, uh, second thoughts about uh, this specific expression. So the bottom line, which is correct, is that if you have a B mode, this can only probe something which is not a scalar mode and is something that has been used to search for primordial gravitational waves. Okay, and so you probably have heard of BICEP where they thought they had detected gravitational waves and in the end it was uh, consistent with foregrounds but they still are the uh, instrument that has measured uh, the um, polarization to the greater uh, level of depth. 
So I want to now switch to giving you some basics of parameter estimation. So let me just pause this for a second and share something else. Esina, sorry, there is a yes. question uh, from Gustavo Salinas. When you define V from PAB, are you throwing out uh, some information contained in PAB? So you are not actually throwing out information because PAB has, it's a symmetric, trace-free and transverse tensor. So it has two independent degrees of freedom. So if I take this divergence on one side, this becomes a vector which is transverse to the direction of propagation and it still has two degrees of freedom. So actually you're not throwing information. You still have the same uh, components. Uh, good question. So let me share something else just as a quick illustration. Had some fun making this Mathematica notebook. So this is the CMB power spectrum, theoretical power spectrum produced with some fixed cosmological parameters. The name of the game is to compare this to the data. And so the, the name of the game is to compute this theoretically for different values of the parameters and compare with the data. So here I just wanted as a recap of a little bit of what we've seen. We couldn't go in much detail, but this, these are the six vanilla cosmological uh, parameters. The most basic six parameter lambda CDN. The first one is AS, is the amplitude of the primordial curvature power spectrum. Since CL is directly linear, linearly related to the primordial curvature power spectrum, this AS parameter only affects the overall amplitude. Okay, it's just an overall amplitude. The second one is NS, is the slope of the primordial curvature power spectrum. So if I have an NS greater than its um, you know, best fit value here, you are gonna tilt the power spectrum to get more power at small scales relative to large scales. And if you lower it, you're gonna make it more red, i.e. you're gonna have more power at large scales relative to small scales. Okay, so NS controls the slope of the primordial curvature perturbations, hence the slope of the uh, overall slope of the uh, CMB temperature power spectrum. Then this parameter, I didn't have time to discuss it in much detail. I told you what the reionization did, but I didn't explain what it did to the CMB anisotropies. But basically in terms of temperature, the reionization optical depth is mostly degenerate with the change of amplitude. So it mostly suppresses, if you have a, a larger e tau, it mostly suppresses the power spectrum by e to the minus two tau. And as a consequence to really measure this parameter, you really need polarization, which breaks this de degeneracy. The parameter, so, so omega b and omega c determine the evolution of perturbations up until around last scattering. And so they will determine the shape of the CMB power spectrum. For example, the, the omega, omega B parameter, if you increase it, you have more baryons, it will change this baryon loading, which I very briefly mentioned, which sets the ratio of the odd to even peaks, okay? Omega C will also, something I did not talk about at all, the, the effect of uh, dark matter, but it will change matter radiation equality, et cetera. But basically you can also measure the abundance of dark matter from CMB anisotropies. And again, I did not have time to discuss any details. And finally, H, the Hubble parameter today. So this is just H uh, zero over hundred kilometers per megaparsecs. So this is basically one-to-one -one degenerate with the, uh, this, this is equivalent to asking what is the moving distance to the surface of last scattering. So changing H is mostly acting as a shift in the angular scale of the CMB power spectrum, okay? So again, I'm sorry, this is a very, very uh, limited explanation, but I encourage you all to look at Wayne Wu's tutorials to, for more details and you know, pick up some book to learn more about the CMB. So what I want you to talk about now is That's how, so, yes? Sorry, I just noticed that there is some discussion about uh, whether the Mathematica code is available. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I can try. I, I can try to make it available. But basically, it's very simple. I just took, you know, class CMB Boltzmann code. I computed the best fit CLs, and then I computed CLs at some slightly offset cosmological parameters. I computed their, their, their first derivatives, 
And then I just made this uh, animate object with Mathematica. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and for the question of ISW, uh, so the ISW, there are actually two ISW effects. There's the so-called late ISW and the early ISW. So phi dot and psi dot, which is the, this ISW, uh, are zero when you have pure matter domination. But if you have early on, you have radiation domination, you know, or the, the universe is not just pure matter domination and radiation to matter transitions around redshift of 3000. So this changes this phi dot and psi dot. Uh, and this, you know, is still present uh, around uh, the last scattering surface. And then you have the late ISW, which is mostly affecting the very uh, large scale plateau. So yes, there is a modification for the entire spectrum, not the entire spectrum, but not just at the large scale plateau from this early ISW. Uh, there is no CAM class code in Mathematica. I think there's someone who wrote something called C M B E Z, but I'm not sure. I don't think there's a CAM class code in Mathematica. So uh, let me continue uh, to this, to a very brief, introduction to parameter estimation. So what's the name of the game? The name of the game, you, everyone, Paolo, you see my slides here, the parameter estimation? Yeah, I do. Okay, good. So the name of the game is, we want to estimate the cosmological parameters given the data, okay? In general, this is a very general statement, just not just for CMB. What we do know is, if you give me some parameter, omega i, so in this case, omega it could be omega b, omega baryon, omega CDM, Hubble constant, reanalyzation optical depth, AS, NS, okay? I'm calling them omega with a vector. So what we know in general is the probability distribution of the data given some cosmological parameters. So for example, if you give me cosmological parameters, I can compute the CLs, which are the variance of the temperature uh, anisotropies, i.e. Their, their power spectra, which is their variance. And so then I know that the actual realization of temperature anisotropies should be a Gaussian with that variance. Okay, so I know how the data should be distributed given some theoretical model. But in practice, what we do is we have one and only one realization of the data. And we want to try and infer the inverse problem. We want to infer what are the underlying or rather the most likely underlying uh, theoretical parameters. So for this, the uh, what people use is Bayes' theorem. So this is the basic step of Bayesian analysis is saying that probability of some cosmological model, some parameters given the data is, so this is P of A given B is, give, is equal to P of A and B divided by P of B. This is just a very def simple definition of probabilities, conditional probabilities. And then P of A and B is equal to P of B given A times P of A. Okay, so all I'm doing here is using this theorem that P of A given B is equal to P of A and B divided by P of B. And so now we've related the probability of, of parameters given the data to the probability of the data given the parameters. Multiplied by, this P of omega, which is called the prior. So it's some, if you have some prior knowledge of cosmological parameters from some other experiment, or you know, you know that if you're limiting yourself to a flat universe, you want your omega B and omega C to be between zero and one, for example. And the denominator is an absolute probability of the data, which doesn't depend on omega. So it doesn't really matter. You can just uh, you know, scratch it off. So the jargon here is that this, thing is called the posterior distribution of parameters given the data. This probability of data given omega is called the likelihood and this is called the prior. All right. So as an example, if uh, your data, <clears throat> so your data is the theta LMs, the temperature harmonic uh, multiples. But what you observed you know, is not only some true uh, cosmological uh, parameters of cosmological origin, but you also have some noise because your instrument is not perfect and has some noise. You have some random fluctuations in the noise of your instrument. So if I assume that these two are uncorrelated Gaussians, then the variance of this thing will be given by the sum of the variances of these uh, cosmological parameter, the cosmological uh, anisotropy plus the instrumental noise. So then the probability distribution of your observed 
temperature and isotropies, which is the data, given some set of cosmological parameters, will be this Gaussian uh, of uh, theta LM observed with variance, which is the sum of the cosmological CLs plus the noise of the instruments. This is, of course, an extremely simplified uh, you know, analysis, I mean, it's not a simplified description. In practice, we have to account for foreground emission, all sorts of uh, processes in the galaxy and outside the galaxy, which emit radiation around the same frequencies as the cosmic wave background. In the galaxy, you have free-free radiation, synchrotron radiation, emission from dust grains, either because they are heated up and they uh, radiate, uh, or because they're spinning, for example. So those are foregrounds. In addition, you're not looking at the full sky. You have to make some sky cuts. Maybe you didn't, you know, if you have some ground-based experiment, it doesn't look at the full sky, or you want to cut out the galaxy. The noise of instrument also de depends on direction, et cetera. So this is much more complicated than this simple picture here. Just to illustrate, these are, you can find these maps from the Planck uh, website. This is at 70 gigahertz, what Planck actually observes. And this is at 217 gigahertz, what Planck actually observes. So this is dominated by free-free synchrotron radiation and maybe also so-called spinning dust radiation. And this is dominated by thermal, so-called thermal dust emission radiation from large dust grains. And what you see in the background is the CMD. So the way that you get to the actual CMD is by uh, using some prior knowledge or assumptions about the frequency dependence of foregrounds and you can clean up these maps. The bottom row is showing you the noise of these uh, two different frequencies. And you see that you have this highly anisotropic noise because the way that Planck is scanning the sky. So all this to say, I'm not at all uh, an expert on all this stuff, but know that there is a lot of work uh, in you know, extracting these cosmological parameters and a lot of uh, dirty details here into dealing with the maps and transforming them into cosmological parameters. So what we're going to do next, and so yeah, this, this whole, the way to, to do this properly, uh, Valerie mentioned this brief, briefly in the Q&A today, is you do this through a Monte Carlo Markov chain uh, analysis. Actually, it's called Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, analysis, MCMC method. So what you get at the end of these methods are these ellipses, which show the 68%, uh, 95% confidence regions of different parameters. Okay, and in addition to the cosmological parameters, when Planck collaboration or others show these ellipses, they have already marginalized over all sorts of nuisance parameters, i.e., you know, all the parameters that characterize the foregrounds and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what I want to do today is give you the minimal theorist under understanding of the data analysis process. So you can at least have some idea of how to is estimate the sensitivity of Planck or make a forecast for future experiments. Okay, this is called the Fisher analysis. So the Fisher analysis, the first step is consisting in saying, okay, if, so this is the posterior, if the posterior is maximized close to the best fit parameter, omega star, then the d log p d omega at omega star is zero. Okay, so if it's a maximum, it's derivative of zero. So I can do a Taylor expansion of this log posterior close to the best fit parameter. So it's going to be some constant plus a term quadratic in omega minus omega best fit because this first derivative is zero. This term quadratic here, there's a matrix here, which is just the second derivative of this log posterior with respect to omega i and omega j, and this is called the Fisher matrix. So this is nothing but a, a Taylor expansion of the posterior close to the best fit parameter. So close to the best fit parameter, then what we're saying, because this is the log of it, if you now take the exponential, you get, uh, actually this should be a minus log, it should be a minus log if you want to have the proper minus sign. So you get that your distribution should be an exponential a Gaussian distribution. And you know that in a Gaussian distribution, the matrix that comes here is the inverse covariance matrix. So this F matrix, this Fisher matrix, is the inverse of the covariance matrix of your cosmological parameters. So this is a Gaussian 
with mean omega star and with covariance inverse of this Fisher matrix. Okay, so now we're gonna try and estimate a simple Fisher matrix uh, for, from, uh, for, for CMB. So the way we're gonna do this is by building an approximate likelihood for uh, the CLs. So this is something I was talking about yesterday, this notion of uh, <clears throat> cosmic variance is going to come up now. So given the measured data, theta LM, the temperature and isotropies, we know that the CLs are the variance of the theta LMs. So we can construct what is called an estimator. So an estimator is some combination of your data that is supposed to estimate a parameter that you're looking after. So this CL hat, estimators are denoted with hat, is just the average over all Ms of the square of the modulus squared of theta LM squared minus the instrumental noise, supposing that I know the instrumental noise. If I take the average of this estimator, remember that the variance of this observed theta LM is the sum of the cosmological CL plus the instrumental noise. And then because I've subtracted this, I get precisely CL of omega hat. So the uh, vocabulary for this saying that the average of your estimator over realizations of the data is equal to the, qu the quantity you're after. This is uh, the word for it is saying that the estimator is unbiased. It gives you on average the correct uh, quantity that it's supposed to estimate. However, any estimator is going to be noisy even if it, on average it gives you the correct quantity and you know, if you had many universes for any given realization of the data, well, it might be a little bit off. So it has some variance that one can compute. So the variance is this average of CL estimator minus the, minus the mean. And so if you plug in through here, you can compute the variance. Uh, so this, this term comes, this double sum comes from this term. And then these terms come from this term multiplying this term. Okay, so again, this is going a little bit fast, but you'll have the slides so you can sit down and go through this derivation and check for yourselves that this is indeed uh, the right answer. And if I find a mistake, let me know. So then remember that theta LM, theta star L prime M prime is Kronecker delta of M M prime, Kronecker delta of L prime times CL. This is something I didn't prove exactly, but uh, I encourage you to do so. So I didn't post the homework for this lecture, but because it's the last one in the last week, but this is one of the things you should check for yourselves. If you have a statistically uh, an isotropic, so if you have a, a correlation function, which only depends on n dot n prime, prove that this then uh, becomes the case for theta LM times theta star L prime L prime. If moreover the temperature uh, an isotropy is Gaussian distributed, then we know how to take uh, the average of four, the product of four Gaussians. And it's basically, this is called Wick's theorem, it's basically the product of all combination of two of them. So number one, average of one, two times three, four, then average of one, three times two, four, this is this line, and then one, four times two, three, this is the last line. And every time you use this equation, and if you have uh, one theta, which does not have a, two thetas without a star, you use this relationship between uh, the theta LMs. So at the end of the day, if you plug it all in, you get that expression. The variance of the CLs is two over two L plus one times CL plus NL squared. Now, uh, again, you should work it out yourselves. The basic idea here is that for every L, I have two L plus one independent samples. And so if I have two L plus one independent samples, so if I ask what is the signal to noise, so CL divided by RMS of CL is going to be square root of two L plus one, okay, over two. But so basically this is saying that the signal to noise goes as square root of N, N being the number of independent samples. This is a very uh, standard thing in uh, you know, random processes. If you have N independent random processes and you try to measure their mean, you're gonna measure it with a signal to noise of uh, square root of N. So the next thing you wanna uh, prove for yourselves, again, as an exercise, is that these, for different Ls, L and N prime, 
these estimators are uncorrelated. So really the covariance matrix of these estimators is diagonal and this is the diagonal of it. So this cosmic variance business is saying that even if I had zero instrumental noise, I would still have a variance in my estimator, which is two over 12 plus one times CL squared. Okay, so again, this is saying I have only two L plus one independent realizations of the theta LMs. So if I want to infer what is the underlying variance that's uh, of the Gaussian distribution from which they are drawn, I am bound to uh, have some error because, well, I have a finite number of samples. So this is called cosmic variance. And so at this is worse at low Ls because you have fewer samples. And so at low Ls, once your instrument, once NL is under CL, well, you can improve your instrument all you want. You will not be able to measure the low L CLs better because there's a fundamental floor to how well you can measure them. And conversely, if you go to very high Ls, you see that you, your variance goes down as one over two L plus one. And this is what Fabian was talking about today at the Q&A, which is that you have more information, more signal to noise from the small scales. And the same thing is true uh, for uh, large scale structure power spectrum. It's exactly the same kind of reasonings as what I'm showing here. Okay. So now this is where we do a little bit more of an approximation. So theta LM is Gaussian distribution distributed, but CL hat is a sum of theta LM squared. It's not Gaussian distributed. It's a square of two L plus one Gaussians. So it's a chi square distribution uh, with two L plus one degrees of freedom. However, if I have a large number of independent variables, in this case, the theta LM squared, the central limit theorem tells me that the distribution for large L should be Gaussian. And indeed, a cascade distribution with a large number of degrees of freedom is uh, more and more Gaussian. So for large enough L, the probability distribution of the estimator itself becomes more and more Gaussian with a mean, which is equal to the cosmological CL, if we, did a, if we built an unbiased estimator, and with a variance, which is given by this here. And so now we can construct a simple version of the likelihood function. Again, this has nothing to do with like what is actually done in data analysis, but, but you can actually already get some very good handle on the error bars just from this simple likelihood function. So this is just going to be the probability over all Ls because they are uh, independent. We found that the CL hats are uncorrelated between different Ls of this Gaussian distribution of CL hat given CL. So moving on, if you take the product of these Gaussians, it gives you that this likelihood of omega is basically an exponential of sum over L, CL of omega, the theory, minus the estimator, which is built out of the data, squared over the variance. And this variance has a two over two L plus one, which now becomes two L plus one over two, okay? Now remember that the Fisher matrix is the second derivative of the log likelihood with respect to these cosmological parameters. And actually there's a minus that I forgot. And so here, if you neglect terms uh, CL minus CL hat, if it's close to the best fit, you can show that this is the dominant term in the likelihood. It's some sum over all Ls, some weight, which weights the large Ls, i.e. small scales more times the product of two partial derivatives of CLs with respect to omega i and omega j, okay? So again, this is the inverse covariance of parameters omega i and omega j. So if you want to do a Fisher analysis, what do you do? The first step is to know what is this NL, okay? So you need to know what is the uh, sensitivity of the instrument what is the level of random thermal fluctuation in the detector of the instrument per pixel. You need to know the angular size of the pixel because this angular size also comes in in this exponential term. So basically this exponential term tells you that once L, and I think I forgot a squared here, when L is larger than one over theta pix up to some uh, factor of order unity, so on scales which are smaller than the angular resolution of the instrument, your noise just blows up exponentially, okay? And so if you look, for example, the Planck Blue Book or like CMB stage four, they provide 
these kind of parameters so you can make some simple estimates of the sensitivity of the instrument. So that's the first step. The second step is to compute these partial derivatives of the CLs from, from your favorite Boltzmann codes. And then you will, you will, from this, compute this Fisher matrix Fij, and then you invert it. This is, so if you have six parameters, this is a six by six matrix, you invert this matrix. This gives you the covariance of your parameters. And then if you want to know what is the one sigma error bar, you know, forecast what is the one sigma error bar on any one of the parameters is going to be the diagonal, the variance of this uh, covariance matrix. So it's gonna be the variance, which is the diagonal of the covariance matrix, which is the diagonal of the inverse Fisher matrix. This is not summed over I, it's really just the II diagonal uh, element. So I'm gonna, again, switch gears. Are there any questions before? No, no questions. So uh, I will switch gears to a shameless advertisement of my own work. Since this is a school on the challenges of the standard cosmological model, when there's a huge challenge that is not even hiding in at all, which is in the name of the standard cosmological model, which is CDM, okay? So uh, as I explained a little bit, well, though I didn't explain any of the details, but from the measurements of the CMB power spectrum, because the evolution of perturbations depend on the amount of this dark matter, which is basically just some ideal fluid with no pressure and which we assume is non-interacting with the rest of the matter, then you can measure from CMB anisotropies the abundance of dark matter very, very accurately. Okay, and this has been measured by the Planck satellite to within a percent precision. It's 5.36 times more than uh, baryons. Now, the this is not seen just in the CMB. In fact, it was seen elsewhere much before uh, being measured in the CMB. The presence of dark matter manifests itself as some missing mass, some missing mass without which it is not possible to explain the dynamics of different systems. So if you only account for stars and gas, you cannot explain the gravitational dynamics of systems ranging from dwarf galaxies to galaxies, clusters of galaxies, and all the way to cosmological uh, large scale structure. So the million dollar question is of course, what is dark matter? So there are lots of uh, dark matter candidates. Sorry, I'm trying to deal with this uh, Zoom thing, which is really annoying. So there are lots of dark matter candidates ranging from axions, whatever, supersymmetry particles. They also note that this is a nomenclature thing. Uh, this, this, this thing which causes the, of the dynamics of the systems to not be explainable by standard matter could be due not to this additional matter, but could be due to a modification of gravity. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about this here, but this is something to keep in mind. It could also be modification of gravity, but so far no one has been able to come up with a modification of gravity, which still reproduces everything else and does not require dark matter. Okay, so let's talk about two specific dark matter candidates. So first of all, you know, we have all of these standard model particles, the quarks, leptons, and the, the gauge force carriers. Uh, we, perhaps the dark matter is some new uh, particle, and perhaps it's not completely dark. And so the question is, can we detect it through non-gravitational interactions? For example, annihilations into standard model particles or elastic scattering, scattering with standard model particles. Dark matter could also be something that has that is not at all a fundamental particle, but it could be, for example, a macroscopic objects such as primordial black holes, black holes which could have formed in the very early universe due to the collapse of large or order unity uh, perturbations on very, very small scales, which are not probed by a CMB and large scale structure. So now let's, let me very briefly discuss three physical effects that different dark matter candidates can have on the CMB. Yes, Cindy. Yes. Uh, would, you, would you comment on the range 
on the range of masses of dark matter? The uh, theoretical the only, range of this. The only this comments, I mean, I don't have the number in mind exactly, but uh, so if you, if this action like particles, people talk about particles with mass of 10 to the minus 20 V, if I, if I remember correctly, I might, it might be wrong, maybe it's 20, 10 to the minus 18. And then you go all the way to uh, black holes, which could be a hundred solar masses. So I, I'm not gonna be able to get the conversion right, but I'll let you do this conversion, but the range is, is humongous. Okay. It's many, many orders of magnitude. But I don't know if the mass itself is really something that's necessarily such an important uh, thing. The, the, the thing is that all of these things are qualitatively so different uh, candidates for dark matter. So these three paths I wanna briefly, briefly talk about. The first one, I very briefly mentioned the spectrum, the frequency spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. Okay, so I really briefly told you that if you inject energy in the early plasma, so at redshift less than about 2 million, which is times after two months after the Big Bang, this perfect black body as measured by FIRAS, so you could distort this away from a perfect black body. So now the fact that FIRAS measures it to very high precision to be a black body tells us that we have some strong constraints on this energy injection. So many things uh, could uh, lead to energy injection. I wanna talk about something specific related to dark matter which is the fact that if dark matter say elastically scatters with photons or electrons or nuclei, okay, if we look at this diagram here, uh, where the color here is chosen on purpose so that it's uh, your UV complete theory. So uh, what happens? On the one hand, we have in the early universe, our hot photon baryon plasma, whose temperature decays at the body class one over A. And on the other hand, we have this cold dark matter if it's not relativistic, its temperature would want to decay as one over A squared. And if you make them scatter with one another, just like Thompson scattering leads to an exchange of momentum and heat, this will lead to an exchange of momentum and heat. Okay, and so this is now cooling down the plasma. So this would lead in the early universe to a negative chemical potential distortion and to a negative Y distortion. Okay, this is something that we pointed out in 2015. So to show you this more quantitatively, if you just focus on the solid lines here, these, as you crank, for example, if you consider dark matter sc scattering elastically with protons, as you crank up the cross section, you crank up the uh, chemical potential uh, distortion that you would have in the CMB. And eventually you reach a plateau because the total distortion that you can get is maximized if the dark matter is at all times in thermal equilibrium and then the maximum distortion is basically just the ratio of number of dark matter particles per photons. And so this increases inversely proportional to the mass. So if you turn this around, you can say, if I measure, for example, fire ass at some upper limits on mu of order 10 minus four, if I measure mu at this level, how sensitive am I to the dark matter cross-section with baryons, with protons, for example, in this case, as a function of mass, okay? So here, this in a recent paper I showed, so FIRAS currently is not very constraining compared to other experiments uh, for dark matter proton scattering, for example. It is better for dark matter electron scattering simply because not people have not really looked into this in much detail. But if so, so some planned experiments, spectral distortion experiments, hope to go to 10 minus eight, maybe 10 minus nine uh, sensitivity to spectral distortions, in which case you could probe dark matter proton or dark matter electron cross sections much weaker than in some cases than some existing limits. So that was aspect number one is the spectrum of the CMB. I just gave you one example, but of course the, spec the, CMB, the frequency spectrum of the CMB can probe many other uh, pieces of physics. Aspect number two, ionization history. The ionization history, as I mentioned, uh, hopefully I conveyed this, CMB temperature and polarization and isotropies are very sensitive to the way that the universe recombined and later reionized. Okay, so, so this is just this very exaggerated bump here, but it's showing you that if you add a 10% bump, you can really uh, significantly affect things. And so in practice, CMB and isotropies are sensitive to sub percent uh, corrections to deionization history. So we can use this to probe another 
process. What if dark matter annihilates, for example, directly to photons or perhaps to electron positrons or muons, anti-muons, basically if it annihilates to electromagnetically interacting particles. Well, what it's gonna do, this is going to change the rate of recombination and the rate of the temperature of the matter evolution by adding some terms which are proportional to the rate at which dark matter injects energy into the plasma. So this is proportional to the cross-section of dark of annihilation of the dark matter, sigma v, times the number density squared, because it's a two-particle process, times the mass, which is the, the energy which is injected per annihilation, which is the mass of the dark matter particle. Okay. So this is just showing you some paper we wrote in 2012, with there are lots of papers written on this topic. Um, how this as you crank up the this parameter how you are basically ionizing the universe beyond standard and heating up the universe beyond standard. So this is constrained by the Planck collaboration. So first let's rewrite this in terms of, so this number density of dark matter particle is just the mass density squared over the mass of one particle squared. So this becomes sigma V over M chi. So CMB observations are sensitive to this specific combination so they constrain the sigma v over m chi less than some value, meaning sigma v less than something times m chi, which is why in this plots, this exclusion plot from the Planck collaboration, the upper limit on sigma v is linear in m chi, okay? And so this is showing you that the Planck collaboration, this is the cross section that you would require to get a thermal relic um, uh, abundance the, the, the so-called WIB miracle, if you have this annihilation cross-section precisely, you would get exactly the, the right amount of dark matter today. So you see that at low masses, the Planck uh, limits rule out uh, such a thermal relic cross-section, but at high masses, they uh, do not. So another similar, um, very similar uh, aspect, but for a completely different dark matter candidate is that if the dark matter is made of primordial black holes, okay? Now these black holes are going to accrete some of the gas in the, that's surrounding them in the early universe. So you have to figure out their accretion rate, M dot. Then anything that accretes, the black holes that accrete uh, baryons will tend to uh, re-radiate part of the uh, accreted rest mass. So the next step is to figure out what is the luminosity of these black holes. In other words, what is the efficiency of a radiation of these black holes? And then once you figure out with the efficiency with which it's deposited into the plasma, this additional radiation again is going to ionize and heat up the hydrogen uh, gas beyond standards. You will, you're gonna change the free electron fraction as a function of the mass of the primordial black hole and of its fraction beyond uh, standard. And this affects the CMB anisotropy power spectra uh, and you can turn this around saying, well, we measure uh, such power spectra and you can figure out what is therefore the upper limit on the abundance of primordial black holes. So this is a fraction of dark matter in primordial black holes as a function of their mass. And these are two limiting cases of uh, limiting assumptions about the accretion physics uh, to show how uncertain this remains. But basically you can rule out primordial black holes from making all of the dark matter if they're heavier than 100 solar masses or so. And the last thing I will just mention very briefly, since I'm already over time. So I told you there are three qualitative probes that you can use for uh, effects that you can use uh, from the CMB to test dark matter. One is the spectral distortions, so it probes heat injection. The second one is the ionization history, which also probes energy injection, but at a very different redshift. One is at redshift two million, the other one is at redshift a thousand, and they're different. They're normalized to different quantities. And the third one is if, for example, dark matter interacts with baryons or neutrinos or photons, if it has some uh, elastic cross section with them, just like photons and baryons exchange momentum, and this is really important to the evolution of CMB anisotropies. This exchange of momentum between baryon and dark matter or dark matter and photons or neutrinos will affect the linear evolution of the primordial density perturbations. And so then this will affect the CMB temperature and polarization power spectra. Uh, 
And then you can turn this around again to set some upper limits on the cross section of dark matter. In this case is with protons, uh, given the observed uh, CMB and isotropies. And this is forecasted to get better by, you know, up to factor of uh, 30 or two, two orders of magnitude with upcoming uh, CMB experiments. So I'll stop here. I don't have any fancy slides. I'll just leave you with this, I think, beautiful image from uh, the Planck collaboration, which is a smooth map of the CMB polarization. There are so many more things to talk about in the CMB, but five hours is rather short. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of a taste of the really beautiful physics that's underlying uh, the cosmic background and that there's still uh, lots of details to dig into. And perhaps we can use the CMB now to go beyond just land the CDM and to try and ask more, uh, more qualitative questions about the nature of dark matter, for example. So I will stop here and take Thank questions. You. Thank you, Yasina. Questions for Yasina? So let's wait for <laughs> clapping. So let's focus if there are any questions left. <laughs> this is the last uh, chance. Uh, I have a question to Yes, you. please, go ahead. Yes, and my question is related with, uh, with the last lecture and the lecture today. Do you remember okay. I asked I ask about the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect? Yes. And then you, you comment about uh, how it's hard to, to measure the effect because yes. the cosmic variance. Yes. And then could you now uh, 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 give them, uh, put these two pieces, the integration yes, yes. and the so, cosmic so, variance so. together? Uh, let me see if I can try and put them together. So remember that the integrated sachs wolf effect happens at large scales. Yes, right? yes. At low L. In the plateau, no? In the, the plateau, in the, and the slight increase on the plateau. So it's low L's, small yes. L's. So what I'm saying now is that the minimum variance that you can hope to achieve on the CLs at low L's is given by this expression here. And again, I, I went a bit fast, so you, but you can go to my slides and derive this. It's really a simple derivation. But the minimum variance that you can get on the estimated value of the CL is two over two L plus one times CL squared. Meaning that the fractional error on the CL is going to be CL divided by square root of this quantity. So the fractional error on the CL, um, sorry, the, the fractional error on the CL is this quantity divided by, by CL. So the fractional error is square root of two over two L plus one. So for example, if I go to L of 10, I get square root of two over 21. So uh, square root of one tenth, so you know, one third. So at L equals 10, I can measure the hope I can hope, the best I can hope to do is to measure the CLs with a 30% error bar. That's the best I can hope. And you can build as sensitive an experiment as you want you'll just never go beyond this simply because you have one single universe, one single realization. And at L equals 10, I have 20 different ALMs, 21 different ALMs and nothing more. So that's what I meant by, it's difficult to directly measure the sexual effects and I, the integrated sexual effect. And I think people do, uh, that I'm not uh, very familiar with, but I, I think you can try and measure it and maybe it has been done to measure it in cross correlations with uh, Galaxy surveys or something like this. Okay. Okay. Any other question? <clears throat> okay. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, is polarization data enough to break the degeneracy between AS and tau ionization? Well, it, it is uh, to some degree because we, you know, Planck has measured the polarization tau ionization to, I don't remember what's the error bar, but it has measured it, uh, you know, much beyond uh, uh, three sigma. So yes, the polarization, the, the polarization data is enough. You can probably Google right now Planck 
cosmological results and find what is the uh, error bar. I don't remember it. Planck cosmological parameters. If I look now, tau, yes, tau is 0 0.054 plus or minus 0 0.007. Okay, so 54 divided by seven, what? It's like eight sigma. So Planck has measured the polarization, the tau to like eight sigma. So yes, polarization is uh, definitely enough to break this degeneracy. All right. If there are no other questions, maybe we no, can- I, I have, I have, I have, I have, I have, I have. Yes. Uh, my, my question now is about distortions of the, mm -hmm. the semi-base spectrum. You talk the, you have talked uh, uh, about distortions, and then I would like to know uh, which is the, the fractional variation in the temperature that mm -hmm. is expected from distortions, from the usual distortions. So I'm not sure what you, so, okay, let's set the vocabulary. So if you say temperature, in general, delta you T over T. Spectrum. Like a delta T over T. So if you say T, then you mean no distortions. So if I say T, I mean the black body spectrum. Yeah, T, delta no T F of zero is no distortions, okay? Okay, okay. okay. Then delta T over T is yes. the contribution of the distortion. This is 10 to minus two, 10 to minus five. No, 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 no. So, okay, so delta T, so distortions is delta I nu intensity yes. over I nu, okay? Mm -hmm. But it's, going, and, and it's, it's not, not possible. A, it's not possible to, to transform uh, these parameters mu and y in, 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 in variation of the temperature for a given redshift. I mean, if you let, let's not talk about temperature because temperature either it means truly a black body temperature, in which case it means by definition you assume no distortions. Okay. Or you're using the, the, observer, the observer's okay. vocabulary where, where temperature is a conversion from intensity. So let's talk about intensity. So then I will change, change a little bit the question. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, using the, the standard uh, uh, collisional terms that provoke yes. distortions, uh, which is the, the maximum effect that is expected. So, so there's no terms that provoke distortions, the collisional terms. If anything, they tend to erase distortions. They tend to thermalize them. To provoke mm -hmm. distortions, you need some additional source terms. And mm -hmm. so the standard, the standard things in the standard universe, we have cooling of photons by baryons. And this is a further, the number of baryons per photon. So it's 10 minus nine, this distortion that is expected. The other term is that injects energy is of order the fractional delta now is order delta t over t squared because this is due to the dissipation of acoustic waves and the power the the energy density in acoustic waves is you know the is like a delta dot squared so you get some delta t over t squared and this is also of order to minus nine. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but there, these are the the things that you expect. In the standard vanilla universe, you expect 10 to minus nine distortions. Uh, okay, distortions come from uh, unexpected sources of energy. You inject yes. energy from different from the, the collisional, the standard uh, uh, Compton contribution. And then for these sources, happen the injection of energy and then this provoke when thermalized provoke. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, no, no. So, so if you have injection of energy, then the Compton collision term, all of these terms, they tend to erase your distortions. Everything in the universe is trying very hard to thermalize. Okay? Yes. Everything is trying to thermalize. So if you inject energy too early, then it's gone, it's thermalized. In this view, so it's really is you have in, in, in this view, it's not possible to, to do a deposit of, a, of energy of a photons in the same B uh, preserving the spectrum, in, a, in, in quasi equilibrium and preserve the spectrum. 
this kind of, of creation is impossible. Uh, I don't, yeah, it seems difficult. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you inject photons energy at redshift greater than 2 million, it's exactly what's gonna happen. It's going to become a black body spectrum at a higher temperature, but you know, whatever happened at redshift earlier than 2 million really doesn't matter for, doesn't matter much. With that being said, I think you can look, there's a paper by Dong He Zhang and uh, I think Joseph Pradler, if I'm not mistaken. If you inject energy very early, even though it thermalizes, then you could maybe affect BBM. Okay. So if you and have then inject energy, you constrain the process. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Let's move. So let, there is a, let's say, one last question by Ndogmo, who raised uh, his hand. I mean, I see it. Maybe he doesn't want to ask him. But, uh, There's also Gustavo, I see. Gustavo. Yeah, I can ask my question if... Sorry, Gustavo, I didn't see you. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, so I, I also wanted to come back at the high ver the large variance of the low mm -hmm. L modes. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe this is a bit silly, but like, uh, let's say I measure this CMV here on Earth, and then I climb on a spaceship, go very far away, and mm -hmm. look at the CMB again. Uh, would those be considered new data points for these low L modes? Or, and how far would you have to go? I think you would have to go basically of order, of order the Hubble uh, radius for them to be uh, independent. I see. So I, I think right. I think you would have to do yeah, nice. but so I think actually I think some people have mentioned this I don't remember if it was through the Sunyaev Zeldovich effect or something like this I think it may have been the Sunyaev Zeldovich effect so if you have some cluster which is a redshift one so you know basically redshift one is like of order the Hubble radius right and mm -hmm. so this cluster will see a different quadruple moment than we see here and so then this cluster will have uh, the will Thompson scatter this quadruple moment and it should have an SG signal which is polarized. And so by looking at the polarization of these clusters, it's like you can probe how the quadruple looks at different places uh, in the universe. And so then you could have more independent measurements of the quadruple. I believe that Mark Minkowski was an author on this on the paper on this paper. I see. Very interesting. Yeah it's Mark Kamionkowski and Avi Lib. Okay. Paper. If anybody all, could put all, that on Slack. That case, it was, it was uh, the quadruples within our past light cone. So it's slightly different than the question he's asking, which is, I mean, maybe you're asking the same question. You have to go to a really different place um, to test uh, some somewhere, which is, I mean, maybe you're thinking outside of our past light cone, but in any case, it's basically the same idea. You have to go away. I mean, from yeah, it has, to be, it has to be uh, somehow in, in our past light cone if we want to be able to observe it, but still it can be uh, basically additional data points. I I'll post it here. Thank you. Okay, one last question from uh, Esteban. What is uh, the relation between primordial black holes and microlensing? So microlensing is one of the observables that uh, one expects from primordial black holes. So basically, if you have primordial black holes in our galaxy floating around, then if there is some uh, star from some other background galaxy, like the Magellanic Cloud or something like this, that happens to be almost aligned with this primordial black hole, then the black hole can lens uh, this star for a brief period of time. And this is called microlensing. So you will see the star becoming brighter uh, briefly, and, and so this is one way that people have been looking for this primordial black holes, or so far setting limits on their abundance. May I answer a question, please? Okay, go sure. ahead, Dongmo. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, please, could we expect uh, to detect particles uh, resulting from the interaction between dark matter and baryon without necessarily detecting dark matter itself. Then uh, could we solve this mystery in this way that uh, 
we can get the particle resulting between the interaction uh, be, be, uh, during the interaction between dark matter and uh, baryon. But mm -hmm. the particle we get could tell us that it, it comes from dark matter indeed. So is it possible to solve this big mystery? Right. That so, so, so I don't know if it's exactly what you're saying, but related, you can look for if the dark matter interacts in the sense that it, in, it's Lagrangian has some interaction term with standard model particles, it can annihilate into photons or electrons or you know, electron positrons. And so you can hope to detect these annihilation products. This is called indirect detection. Or you can try people build these direct detection experiments where they try to look for dark matter scattering with baryons. And then you look for this baryon, this you know, uh, nuclei getting a recoil from dark matter collisions. But you don't, so what you were asking if you can detect if dark matter scatters with baryons and then you produce some other particle. I don't know, uh, maybe in colliders, I don't know if anyone is familiar with collider searches. I don't know if there's any such a search in this case. In general, I think colliders, you collide baryons and then you look for some missing energy or something. Uh, and then indirect detection, you, uh, you look for you know, additional energy, the opposite of missing energy uh, from dark matter particles, which annihilate into uh, photons, for example. I think we lost in Dongbo. Uh, I have a... No, okay. Yeah. And I'm going to have to go actually because I have a meeting in five minutes. <laughs> okay, let's. Uh, well, let's uh, people want to turn on the video so we can uh, maybe clap uh, and leave uh, <laughs> the scene to go to his meeting. So, one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty nice, no? All right. <laughs> okay, very good, very good, very good. So, please do some feedback. Huh? I don't know, yeah, if you have some kind of feedback thing, but it would be great to get some feedback. We're going to uh, for your uh, lectures. Yes. Okay. We're, we're going to have a, a, an evaluation form for the students at the end of the school. <laughs>